Hello and welcome to this POP webinar. My name is Phil Tooley. I'm a member of the POP team at NAG, who are one of the commercial partners in the POP project. Today I'm going to be talking about PyPOP. This is a tool that we've been developing to uh, support performance assessments in the POP methodology and the POP philosophy. So I think I want to start by talking about the, possibly the obvious question, which is why are we developing another new tool? Um, there's lots of tools out there for performance assessment already. There are commercial offerings like Intel's VTune or ARM Map. And of course, within the POP project, we have various tools already, such as uh, the VSC tools, X-Tray and Paravar, uh, the Macau profiler from uh, University of Versailles, UVSQ, and the SCORE-P and Scholastica tools uh, from Forge Centrum ULIC. So these are well-respected tools um, which have been developed for a long time. They're very mature and very capable. So why are we now talking about developing a new tool for POP? And I think the answer comes down to uh, the need to support the POP methodology. So if you were to use um, a tool like um, BSC's X-Tray and Parava, um, it's designed to be able to give you access to all of the detailed information that's going on. So you can really look into uh, the subtleties of how your application is performing in different areas at very short time scales, things like this. And um, similarly, uh, the Scholastica tool, again, allows you to really dive deep into exactly what's going on. And this is great. This is really useful. Um, and it's something that you can't do without when you're doing performance analysis. But actually, when you're just trying to get started, so maybe you're, you're looking at a new code doing your doing a first pass to try and understand what's going on, or maybe you're new to performance analysis and performance assessment, and um, you're trying to get a handle on what your own code is doing. In those cases, actually, having all of this information is almost counterproductive to start with, because it's very difficult to know where to look. If you're presented with all of this information, it can be hard to actually work out um, where any potential uh, problems might be, where any potentials for optimization is, because there's just so much data. So uh, the, the POP methodology and the philosophy behind um, the way that we do our performance assessments within POP is that we begin by taking a much higher level view. And um, this high level view is, um, is, is essentially the POP metrics. So what we do is we we try and we've uh, designed the pop metrics to condense down all of this detailed information into really the smallest possible set of quantitative measurements that we can present that give a good idea of what's actually going on in the application. So the goal for the pop metrics is that they should be easy to calculate and easy to understand what they're telling you about the performance and they should be able to quickly signpost you to where to look in more detail in the code to understand what's going on and to investigate further. So on the right here, I've got an example of the pop metrics. Um, so these are, I've pulled these out of um, my archives from an app, a performance assessment that I did. Um, I'm not going to name the code because it's not important um, and it would be unfair to name the code out of context like this. Um, but what I want to draw your attention to is the fact that um, we've represented the performance here for uh, five different runs of the code from uh, running on a single process up to running on 16 processors. And very quickly, the metrics allow us to see that um, the performance um, as we scale up to more processors is, is not scaling particularly well. It's only at... Um, at 16 processors, we're only getting about half the potential performance we could get. So it's only about an eight to nine times speed up as opposed to the 16 times speed up that we'd hoped for. And looking at the pot metrics, what, that what we can see is that the problem isn't in, isn't in how the, uh, the parallelism is working. So um, the load is balanced well across the different processors and um, the MPI communication is performing efficiently. But actually what we need to look at to understand why uh, why the performance isn't as good as we'd like is uh, the individual processes and the computation that's going on, which has become less efficient as we're adding more processes uh, to the application. So I'm not gonna go into any more detail on this. We have, um, we have multiple webinars uh, uh, and uh, other learning materials that explain in much better detail 
uh, exactly what's going on with the pot metrics and what they're telling you. But the takeaway I want to give you here is that the pot methodology is designed to be able to give quick answers um, to the, the high level questions about where do I need to look where to uh, understand why my performance could be improved. Um, and they're done so using a, a set of easy to calculate and understand metrics. And so the idea then is that we wanted to produce a lightweight tool that actually supports this core methodology. So we wanted a tool that um, makes it easy to calculate the pot metrics and just as importantly makes it easy to visualize and to explore and understand those metrics. So what we wanted to do is not to just plot a table or plot a scaling plot. We wanted to be able to give a bit more contextual information around that to allow people to actually explore the metrics um, particularly so that um, people who are newer to performance profiling, people outside of the POT project can um, get a deeper understanding of how the metrics work. On top of that, we wanted to make it as easy as possible to actually share the results that are generated from, from PyPOP and to share the metrics and any scaling plots and so on. And we wanted to make it as easy as possible to share an annotated version of that. So um, we want to be able to make it so that um, you, an you can analyze your code and you'll get the metrics and you'll get the scaling data. And then you can actually, in the same place as where those metrics are created, you can then give it, um, you can actually give the contextual inform information. You can talk about why you think this, what's going on and what the next steps might be and bundle that up into a nice little report. And so I'll, uh, I'll give a demonstration later on of um, how we achieve that in PyPOP. And then finally, we wanted to be able to provide a few extra tools um, that we've identified that would be useful for uh, further deeper analysis um, and also make a kind of general framework that allows people to develop their own tools for custom analysis where they might need them. One thing I'd like to say here is that PyPOP is not another profiler. It's designed to be lightweight, so we're not reinventing the wheel. We're not re-implementing a whole profiler here. What we're trying to do is we're trying to use the data that comes from existing profilers. So to begin with, we've targeted the X-Tray profiler from BSC. And our focus is on adding a high-level layer that provides some additional ease of use uh, for uh, using that profiler within the POP methodology and the POP philosophy. So in the rest of this webinar, I'd like to give a demonstration of how to actually use PyPOP to um, analyze some traces that I gathered earlier. And I'll show through this how PyPOP achieves the various goals that we set out to achieve with it. So the first goal for PyPOP was to be able to quickly and easily calculate the POP metrics. So we provide both a GUI tool and a CLI tool for this. And the reason for that is that we want to try and make it as easy as possible to calculate the metrics regardless of what circumstances you might be using PyPOP in. And um, I'll give a demonstration of both of these, but obviously they're both going to start in the same way, which is we need to collect traces with a supported tool. Now, the main tool we support at the moment, as I mentioned, was X-Tray. Um, and so I've gone ahead and I've done that ahead of time. I've, ca I've captured some traces. I'm not going to go into the details of how to, how to actually do that. Um, and uh, the POP project has materials available for that on the website that will uh, teach you how to uh, use X-Tray. So the first step in this process that's actually provided by PyPOP is um, this, what, this step two that I've marked as optional, but I highly recommend. And that is to pre-process those uh, collected traces. And typically, if you're working on a remote HPC system, for example, you're going to do this as a batch job in the background where you're getting on with other things. And the reason we provided this step is because the traces that are captured with a tool like X-Tray can be extremely large. It captures so much detailed information in short, in such fine-grained short timescales uh, that the trace files, when you analyze an application, can be tens or even hundreds of gigabytes in size. So for that reason, um, to, in order to save uh, the user's time, we provided this batch tool that allows us to pre-process the traces. And what that's going to do is it's going to produce a small summary file that um, can then be downloaded or can be uh, to a local machine or can be just used in situ. But um, it means that any any sort of user interactive process is going to be much faster because it's able to load a much a small pre-processed summary file rather than the full um, trace file that might be, as I say, hundreds of gigabytes in size.
And then once we've done this pre-processing step, we can then actually run the pipop GUI or the command line tool, which will uh, generate, uh, calculate the actual metrics and generate uh, a metric table and a scaling plot. Now, step two of our goals for pipop is tied up very t tightly with this, which is being able to visualize and explore the pot metrics. So obviously the plotting features that I mentioned are um, being able to plot uh, scaling plots for the application performance and a table of the pot metrics. And um, in order to be able to explore those in a bit more detail, we've tried to provide some interactive um, user interface elements in the notebook to help describe the metrics so that people can understand them um, and have information about what they're actually being told right there while they're looking at the metrics. And of course, um, in some circumstances, maybe you don't want the GUI, maybe you um, are interested in just getting either a CSV containing the uh, the pot metrics or pre-made uh, PNG image output that you can include in your own reports. And in that case, we have a CLI command line interface tool for that, which can generate the generate the uh, the files without any need for an interface uh, graphical interface. And so you can use that on a remote machine over an SSH connection. So um, this is the uh, this is the command line interface on uh, on my machine, and here are the uh, traces that I gathered earlier for our MPI example. So there's um, there's uh, five different traces here that I've taken from one process all up to sixteen processes in powers of two, so one, two, four, eight, sixteen. Um, and as a little quirk of how Xtray works, each trace has actually got three files. And these files aren't particularly big because I wanted to be able to give you a nice quick example. But the first step, as I say, is that we want to pre-process these files. So um, the command line for this is pipop preprocess, and then we just pass it um, all of the files that uh, all of the files that we want to pre-process. Now um, the key, the the main file is that of the X-ray traces, the .prv.gz. So we pass those files to PyPot preprocess and we say go. And what it's now doing in the background is it's going away and it's going to go over each of those files. It's uh, it's going to load them using um, actually some of the um, the Paraver command line pre processing tools, and it's going to extract the information that we actually need. So. As I say, these traces are fairly small, so the process happens fairly quickly so that I can demonstrate it to you. But you can do exactly the same thing with huge multi-gigabyte traces. And typically if you're going to do that, especially on if you've got a remote HPC system, you might submit that as a batch job and then you can come back the next day or whenever it's completed. And what you will find is that if we take a look at the output in this folder now, what we've got is... Um, along with the original files, we now have these .pipop summary files. And now as, as you see, the, the traces aren't particularly large, so the largest trace here is only 2.4 megabytes. But even so, the smallest, the, the size of the actual summary file is only 187 kilobytes, so we've made it much smaller. And um, the, the pipop summary files will tend to stay around this hundreds of kilobytes kind of size. In fact, you can see here, each of the summary files is 187 kilobytes. So the advantage here then should be that um, even if you have tens, hundreds of gigabytes of trace file, the pre-process will uh, pack that down into just a few hundreds of kilobytes. And what we now have in these pipop summary files is something that's very portable. So if I'd done this step on a remote machine, what I could do now is just download the pipop summary files locally, and they contain all the information for me to do the next analysis steps. So the next analysis step then is to actually uh, produce the pot metrics. So we're, for as long as we're on the command line, I'll demonstrate the command line version first. And um, we have a, a second command line up, um, command for that, which is uh, pipop dash MPI metrics. And what this is going to do, if I just bring up the help for that, um, what it wants us to do is to pass it uh, the trace files. And you can pass it the trace files or you can pass it the summary files. And what's useful about this is if you've already pre-calculated the summary files, you can still pass it the trace files and it will check to see if there's an appropriate summary file that's already been generated. And if so, it'll use that rather than trying to go through the whole processing step again, which could take a long time. Um, there's, lots of, there's lots of options here to um, 
customize how uh, the uh, how PyPop will produce the metrics. But for now, we're just going to go with all the default options. And we say PyPop MPI metrics, and again, we just pass the original files, or I could say pass all of the PyPop summary files, and I'll get the same behavior either way. Press enter, and it will go away, and it will quickly process everything, and it will take a few moments, and when it returns, if we look at what we've got in our folder again, we'll now see we've got a few extra files. So we have a metrics.csv file. So this is a little CSV file that you can load with Excel or a spreadsheet program or any other sort of data analysis uh, program that you like that contains all of the, all of the metrics numbers. And we also have two PNG files, a scaling.png and a table.png. And these are ready to use, um, ex these are ready to use plots that contain all the information. So if I just get rid of the console for a minute, um, there we have our, uh, our scaling plot. And similarly, I can show you the, the metrics table. So very quickly, very easily, just a few command line um, steps we've produced a nice print a nice printed table of the pot, pot metrics and we've produced our scaling plot so that's all well and good but i promised you a gui and a gui you shall have so to load the pipop gui we have yet a lot another little command line command pipop dash gui and what that's going to do is it's um actually going to start up an instance of the uh, jupyter notebook server and it's going to create a notebook for us that contains our gui and the reason that we've done this in um, IPython notebooks for our GUI is for two reasons. The first is it's nice, quick and easy to develop in. And the other reason is that it's very portable and it's very extensible. So because um, because we've got uh, Python code right here in the notebook, it makes it very easy for uh, anyone who knows some Python to extend this however they might like. But at the same time, it's... Um, a sufficiently uh, graphical interface that anyone who doesn't know any Python will should still be comfortable enough to at least use the at least use the, the built-in features. So in order to use this notebook, all we're going to have to do is click Run, and this is the basic PyPop GUI. So what it's asking us to do now is to load some trace files. So this is the equivalent of what we were asked to do, um, what I had to do, sorry, for the um, the command line application I had to tell it which traces to analyze in the same way I'm going to do this so here we are in our directory and what I'm going to do is I'm going to load the uh, the PRV files themselves now you don't have to do this if as I say if you downloaded them you can load the pipop summary files themselves and in fact you can do a mix of both and you can do them in any order so that's 16 processors one process uh, two processors uh, four processors and the last one will be eight processors so let's load those in okay so I've clicked whatever came up and I've got a I've got a mix here of um, the, the the trace files themselves the prv.gz files themselves and the, the summary files and that doesn't matter because there's a tr there's a summary file for each one so pipop will just find those and we hit analyze and then pipop's gone ahead and it's created some extra tabs in the GUI for us and the first tab here contains our metrics table so this is the same table, exactly the same table that was produced um, by our um, command line interface, but now it's a little bit interactive. And um, what we get, as well as the table, is we can mouse over it and we can get some extra information. So now, as I mouse over the different levels, you see I can mouse over the load balance or the communication efficiency metrics, and it will give me some detailed description of what the metric actually means. So as we go through, and I've got this big red oh dear, 0 0.61 for my computation scaling, I can look at that and it can tell me, you know, tell me what the computational scaling is. So I can understand, oh, so the computational scaling isn't very good. What does that mean? And I can see it right here. The other thing that I can see in this GUI then is the scaling plot. Um, and again, this is exactly the same scaling plot that was produced by the, um, by the command line interface. And what we can, and what we've done here with the scaling plot is we've just added some we added some sort of coloured areas to the plot just to give to give you a guide as to how well your application is doing. So this top green band here is scaling better than eighty is the scaling better than eighty percent band. So if you're in this band here, um, your application's actually doing pretty great. Eight, more than eight, better than eighty percent scaling is considered to be 
um, is considered to be excellent. And then this sort of this main orange area here is where your scaling is your scaling is suboptimal, but you're still getting faster as you add more processors. So if you, if you're in this region here, then there's work to do, but nothing, but it's not particularly terrible. You're still getting gains, provided the line is still continuing to go up. And then in this red region here, this is this is negative scaling. So if you're unfortunately if you're in this region, it's telling you that your um, your performance is actually getting worse. Your code is getting slower as you try and use more processors to solve the problem. But hopefully you're not there. So what's the next step then? And really, the next step in our roadmap is uh, enabling the easy sharing and annotating of the results. So what we want to be able to do is um, take the analysis that we've do just done in that uh, GUI in the user interface uh, and convert it into something a bit more static and archivable. Um, on top of that, what we want to be able to really do is add some descriptions and some discussion and all the contextual information that the user has to uh, the results that we've just generated so that uh, there's something meaningful there beyond just some plots on their own. And then ideally what we'd like to be able to do is support the ability to actually share that either just in the form of an IPython notebook that can be opened and used by other people who've installed PyPop or in fact being able to convert that to a PDF and to be able to share with anyone who uh, can just open the PDF and read what you want to tell them. So if we uh, go back to our GUI, um, we can now use this fourth tab that's titled Report Generation. And what this is going to do is it's going to take the analysis that we've just done and it's going to put it into a report, as I said. So um, all we have to do first is just give it a little bit of metadata that um, will be used later if we want to uh, create a PDF report. So um, it's going to ask for an application name and we'll just call it Phil's secret code because I haven't told you what it is. Uh, we need a report author name which is me and I have contributors who are you lovely webinar watchers everywhere. And you might want to put a report ID in as well and typically for pop we'd put a report ID in so that we can uh, we can track exactly uh, which analysis this was part of. Now we hit generate and not a lot seems to have happened and the reason for that is unfortunately we can't get Jupyter note we can't get one Jupyter notebook to open another but we've clicked generate and it will now have actually created this file so if we go to file and open this is our this is our um, our folder where we've got all of the traces and we've got the PNG files we uh, created earlier and we've also got this new notebook has appeared called report so as I open that up what we find then is that we've got another notebook but this time there's a lot more in it and the reason there's a lot more in it is this is now the static version of what the GUI was doing for us before. So if I just go ahead and run all the cells in this notebook, that's going to run all the code, all the Python code, and it's going to recreate the plots that we had before. So we have our scaling plot here, and we have our metrics. And this is a bit of a skeleton document as well that uh, is designed for you to just be able to put in whatever you want, really. So um, the intention here is to allow people who don't want to write any Python to still produce a nicely formatted report. So what we have here are, along with the cells that have got the Python code in it, we've got some cells that have just got text in it. And this is formatted using Markdown, which is um, quite a, a common format on the web. So it's, it's used for um, putting bullet points and a little bit of formatting into things like um, text on GitHub. So what we can do is we just... I can spell it, start an introduction chapter, and then I'll just uh, drop in some placeholder text that I've got on the clipboard. And so we can start to put in all the information that we might want to discuss what's going on and what's in our report. So fill in the application information if you want. Um, and then, of course, we can just here we can discuss our scaling results and why they look like what they do. And similarly, application efficiency metrics here, we've got our pop metrics, and then we can we can stick in a bit of a discussion here and finally we can stick in some conclusions and so without writing and so what we've got now is we've got something that we can share but contains more than just the code it's everything together and this is this is what's called um, this is what's called literate programming and um, so what we've done is we've mixed uh, the code 
and the text and the output all together so that what we've got is we've got essentially a, a one single document that does and describes everything. So what you could do now if you wanted to is you could send this to um, any collaborators that you had. You send them this little notebook and the summary files that were created. You don't have to send them the whole traces and then when they run this notebook they'll get exactly the same thing as you and so you can collaborate on um, on any kind of uh, performance assessment that you want to do this way. The other thing that we can do is we can actually turn this into um, a PDF report. So if I go ahead and save this file now what I can then do is uh, go back to go back to our command line interface um, and I can just shut down I'll shut down the notebook server now because um, we don't need it anymore. We've done everything that we want to do in the notebook for now. And of course, because I've unceremoniously killed it, it's now it's now complained at me on the command line, but we don't need to worry about that. Um, if we have a look in our directory now, as as we would expect, our uh, our report notebook is right there. And so what we can do now to um, to convert that to a PDF, we can use um, another inbuilt PyPop tool, which is built on top of um, a tool included in Jupyter Notebooks to do exactly this, to convert Jupyter Notebooks into a PDF. And so we just call ipynb to report and then pass it report.ipynb and it'll go ahead and do that conversion now for us. And what it's doing is it's uh, converting it through a, an, a through a LaTeX as its uh, intermediate format and it's also at the same time going to uh, apply some pop formatting and some pop branding to it. And so now we've got a, our report written successfully. Um, if we go ahead and open that and I just use my little lightweight PDF viewer for that. Um, what we find is um, that we've got a nice little nice little uh, three page report here which has got all of the all of the text that we put into it and it's also got the images that we put into it as well and all of our discussion. So um, of course you can go ahead and then form you can put as much effort as you want into actually formatting this with uh, with the markdown in the notebook. Um, convert it to PDF and then you've got something that you can share. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about then is how we've tried to design PyPop for extensibility and customizability. So one of the goals here is to try and support people to do the analysis that they need to do, not the analysis that we've designed for them to be able to do. So the idea is that PyPop should be easy to extend so that you can analyze the data however you need to for your particular situation rather than having to rely on a statically designed tool. So to do that what we've done is we've made sure that wherever we can in PyPop we use standard Python data science APIs. So particularly we use NumPy and Pandas to actually store the data and provide um, the analysis routines. And we use the Bokeh library for uh, plotting and that's what we've used to produce the interactive plots. And hopefully based on this then anyone who is familiar already with these basic Python data science tools will be able to extend the available functionality in PyPop to do whatever they need to do. And so to give an example of this I want to uh, share with you something that we wrote recently um, to allow us to do more detailed OpenMP analyses and we call this the OpenMP Region Explorer. So to demonstrate this, I'm going to jump back to a, another notebook that I've uh, prepared earlier. And we're importing some uh, some tools from PyPop again. But this time, rather than importing the GUI, I'm importing two lower level things. The first is this PRV class. And that's what la allows us to actually um, load all of the tra all of the data from the um, X-Tray trace and provide it as an easy to access and easy to manipulate uh, Pandas data frame. And the other thing I'm going to include is the um, OpenMP Region Explorer that we developed. So I'll go ahead and import that. And then the next step is going to be to actually load the trace into the PRV class. So this trace is a hybrid MPI and OpenMP trace, as you will see in a moment. And what we've actually done with this PRV class is we've um, implemented some caching, say the same as we have done with the um, with the basic PyPop uh, metrics calculator, so that um, the first time that you load a PRV trace, it could be quite slow, particularly if the trace is large. But once you've loaded it that first time, subsequent loads should be faster due to the fact that we've cached in a PyPop friendly format. Okay, 
So I've loaded all the data. And before I actually show you um, the region explorer, I just want to show you um, what you actually get once you've loaded this data. So we have this myprv object that contains all the data. And then if we want to see what's in there, we can look at the event data frame. And this is a very low level view, but it gives us all of the all of the events and the values associated with those events that um, are computed by Xtray when it does the tracing. And so all of these events can be looked up and um, calculated to have uh, some meaning. So, for example, um, this will encode things like uh, the start of an OpenMP region, um, an OpenMP uh, task or an OpenMP function or a loop that's called with inside the in, called inside the region and so on. And so what we can then do very quickly using um, standard uh, pandas uh, operations and standard Python API operations uh, from NumPy as well is uh, manipulate that data and get it into the format that we want. So in our case, what we did was we wanted to reconstruct every individual OpenMP region inside this data so that we could view individual regions and work out if there were particular areas, particular individual OpenMP regions that were performing poorly. And so that's what this OMP region explorer does. And it'll take a moment to plot because it's quite a lot of data. But once we have, what we find is that we've got something of a timeline. So time here is on the X axis. And then on the Y axis, I have the four processes, the four MPI processes in, in the trace. And each of these processes is, contains uh, 12 threads. And so what I've done here, what this actually shows is every single open MP region. So some of them are quite large. For example, this one is 0.7 seconds. And then some of them are very, very short. So down at the 0.1 seconds or even smaller. And as you can see, I've, uh, as with, as with the basic PyPop GUI, uh, we've included some uh, interactive tool tips that allow us to actually quickly view lots of detailed information. And so what we can now do is, based on the color, we can very quickly see that we have some larger OpenMP regions that are performing relatively poorly. So that's these red shaded regions. If we mouse over, we see that here we've got a load balance of only about 50%. Um, 50%, 0.49%, uh, 49%, sorry, and so on. And most importantly, what we can see is that it actually gives us the function and the location so that we can go and we can immediately go and look in our source code and find out where we want to, where we want to actually um, do some optimization. Okay. So that's just a brief overview of the kind of extensibility that PyPop gives us. And I was able to write this particular um, OpenMP Region Explorer in just a few tens of lines of code because all of the heavy lifting required to get the data into an easily um, accessible and easily manipulatable format is already done as part of the PyPop framework. So that brings us to the end of what I wanted to share with you all today. Hopefully um, that's given you an idea of the kind of things that PyPop's uh, capable of and it's given you a flavor of the thinking behind PyPop and the idea behind the pop metrics and the pop methodology. So i just leave you with a summary. Um, PyPOP was a tool that we designed to be able to provide efficient performance analysis workflows. So at its, at its heart, the idea is that we should be able to quickly analyze traces and compute the pop metrics and produce publication ready tables and scaling graphs from those metrics that we calculate. In addition, we've designed it to allow us to be able to output format, fully formatted PDF reports based on everything that we've calculated. And under the hood, it provides an extensible framework that you can use uh, standard Python data science tools to extend it to provide whatever custom functionality you might want. And finally, I just want to invite you to please uh, check out PyPop, give it a try for yourself. Um, you can. You can get it from the uh, PyPop Pop GitHub page, uh, github.com slash numerical algorithms group slash PyPop. And it's also available in the PyPy Python package repository. And with that, thank you all very much for your attention. And I'll now get to answering any questions you might have. So um, is there a particular reason we picked Python to implement the tool? And as I touched on in the in the presentation, our, our key reasoning really was that um, we wanted to make something with the broadest possible appeal. 
um, and the broadest possible uh, cross-section of people who would be able to um, use it not just as a tool but also as a framework and that's the that's kind of the goal here is not is it we don't want it to really just be a static tool we've we've tried to expose all of the all of the data in a way that makes it easy to interact with using the standard um, Python data science tools. Um, so that that's that's really why we chose Python. Um, had another question about how long it would take to pre-process um, 100 gigabyte uh, trace files, and the answer is that the pre-processing can take a really long time. So um, if you've collected multi gigabyte or you know tens, hundreds of gigabytes of trace file, that is potentially going to take a very long time to process. And a big part of the reason for that is just that um, you have to literally pass through all of that data using the um, using the analysis tool. Uh, and what PyPop actually does under the hood is it still uses the command line uh, tools that are published by BSC for analyzing X-ray traces. So um, it's as fast as the it's as fast as the BSC tools would be in the same situation, pretty much. Um, and unfortunately, it's just a limit of the fact that profiling collects so much data. And so that's exactly why we wrote this pre-processing tool is because um, initially when we first wrote PyPop, um, PyPop did all of its analysis um, in the notebook on the fly. Um, and that meant that you could open an IPython notebook, start an analysis, and then have to come back next day to see if your cell had finished computing and you had a result, which wasn't great. Um, so that was the point of the preprocessor, and also to avoid just having to download huge traces to local machines. So um, what we what we've tended to do for our when we're using PyPop ourselves is we'll actually submit the preprocessing as another batch job on the HPC that we've been doing the the profiling on. We just wait for that to complete. Um, I've had a couple of questions three or four questions about um, support for other profilers. So um, at the moment, X-Tray is the only profiler that we properly support. Um, we've been doing a little bit of private experimentation for supporting some of the other profiling tools, both um, pop tools and some commercial tools. Um, and we don't, have a, we don't have a firm roadmap for that, but if there are people who, um, if there are people who are interested in support for a particular profiler, then I would encourage them to open an issue on GitHub with which profiler they'd like support for, uh, and then we can we can try and look into that. Um, the other thing to say is that uh, PyPop has been very carefully designed to be as modular as possible. So adding additional support for a profiler is something that someone with a reasonable understanding of um, how the profiler works um, and some, some understanding of um, Pandas and the Python uh, data science um, libraries should be able to write a plugin to support that profiler relatively easily. Um, one of the other questions that we've had is about the uh, about the pot metrics, um, and uh, how do we get how can someone get the formulas that are used to actually calculate the metrics? So um, this is something that I will freely admit um, we ideally be added to the PyPop documentation. So that's something that we can work on. Uh, but the the metrics themselves are one of the one of the key outputs of the POP project. So if you go to the, the POP website, which is pop-coe.eu, then all the information about the metrics and how they work and some webinars that were given earlier in the project, giving uh, quite a deep dive into the metrics and the POP methodology are available for you there. Okay, so uh, someone's asked if is it available in a standard Python repo, and I somewhat glossed over this at the very end, but yes, um, PyPop is now available via the PyPy uh, Python package repo. So that's um, the the, the repository package repo behind the pip tool. Um, so you can uh, you can install it via pip by um, installing the nag-pypop package, or if you go to the uh, the GitHub link. For the GitHub page for PyPop, the installation instructions are there.
Um, I've also had a question, uh, does PyPOP expose the human readable X-Tray event IDs? And the answer is yes. Um, the, PRV, the PRV class that I demonstrated at the end there does, uh, does have support for reconciling the, um, the event IDs with human readable IDs. Uh, I didn't demonstrate it because it's already quite a big, the trace I loaded was already quite a big trace. And um, under the time constraints I had when I tried to add the human readable event IDs, I ran out of RAM on the machine. I was uh, <laughs> ran out of RAM on the machine that I was actually um, doing the uh, doing the recording on and crashed it. So um, I I can't I didn't do it for that. Tr I I I didn't demonstrate it, but it can be done. And. A question, are there any examples of uh, code and their associated pop metrics to help understand what's going on with them? And yes, so another part of the pop project is we have what's called, uh, we have a co-design project and a co-design repository. And what's the, what that's designed to do is to capture um, common patterns and common anti-patterns in high performance computing. Um, so, things that people do right with their code and things that people often commonly do wrong with their code and um, some demonstrations of you know, the, the the slow code and some other code and uh, a fixed version if you like of of the code that's faster along with um, instructions for how to build the examples and of course the the pop metrics okay so that's i've gone through i've now covered most of the questions um there's a couple of other questions um, that I can, I will give people specific answers to. So if I haven't answered your question um, verbally, I will answer it textually before I uh, leave the session. But um, I've been asked to wrap it up here. So thank you again, everybody, for your attendance, and I hope that was useful. <laughs>